David Bizard here, and you are watching Power Tech 10. Today's subject is tunnel ram intake manifold. Should they be used on the street? What do they take in the way of having the ability to produce uh, manners for street work? Are they really only race only? Can you modify them? What can you do to them? And the list goes on. First off, I want to settle this uh, race only deal, right? When a tunnel ram fails to make it for a street motor, it's because there's something wrong with the geometry or the specification of the engine. And that tunnel ram manifold does not suit that engine. That's just like putting the wrong two plane manifold on or whatever, right? The biggest problem is having ports too big the tunnel ram was initially designed as a drag race manifold and the thing is is the ports tend to be sized on the big side for top end power. Now this is okay if you use a manifold intended for a 350 say and uh, uh, you now bolt it onto a, a 427 inch engine it's probably going to be okay but if the manifolds have the right intake size for the displacement and the RPM range and so on and so forth, they can work very well. My friend Andy Wood has got a truck with a tunnel ram intake manifold and we tested this against a stock intake, a old tunnel ram manifold and the new Holly tunnel ram manifold for a small block Chevy. Well, guess what? That manifold, well, both the tunnel rams work, but the latest one, straight out of the box, was 20 horsepower more than the one that I spent quite a time modifying. Right, so, oh, that means we got a redundant uh, early model manifold. Uh, don't know what to do with it, but I guess we could sell it. Anyway, the thing is, is we're going to look at and his video and the, the the deal will go along the bottom here as to where you can find it but today we're going to look at what you can do to an intake manifold to make it uh, what you can do to a tunnel ram intake manifold to make it work better yet well i've moved the manifold to one of our five school downdraft porting benches Students like these, they can keep their clothes clean, so when they go out for lunch, there's no big shakedown on their clothes and all that. They're in perfect nick, but anyway, what we're going to do here is we are going to look at how the f induction pulses from some cylinders can adversely affect the others. So that's what we'll do now. Stock Chevy f small block firing order is 1843 65 72 which goes like this one eight and it's the furthest away from one as it can be so this induction pressure wave here has virtually no effect on this one eight four now that's still a long way away so this induction and that induction pulse don't interact very much three so we got one eight four three you can see that the big pressure wave coming at one port can affect the other and here's what happens the second cylinder to draw has a big negative pulse come from the overlap 
period from from the exhaust extraction so number three has a slight rubbing effect on number two right it's small it's like maybe one or two percent but it is there but the, let's go on we've got one eight four three six five so this situation is the same as this seven is next so we got one eight four three six five seven this cylinder here robs this one and it's quite badly so we we need to address that situation then we go from seven to two then it goes to one so it's not too bad with this gap between the two but we really have to address this now this particular engine is going to use a 4-7 swap here is the 4-7 swap diagrammatically shown right essentially what we've got here is there's our stock firing order and this is what we're going to change it to now these arrows depict where it goes number four goes here where number seven was and number seven goes to where number four was you can't just do this with the uh, timing spark plug timing change it has to be done with the camshaft now the fact that it alters the the uh, arrangement of the firing order means that the intake manifold in terms of the pressure waves has to be done according to suit this firing order not this one so we'll look at that now with the stock firing order number seven and five were in a robbing situation because they're only this far apart so the pressure wave from one can start sucking charge from the other that seven robs five now let's see how this works out with our new firing order let's just go through the sequence of events on our four seven uh, firing swap right here we go one eight and then instead of four it's now seven then it goes to three then six then five then four and then two so this cylinder wants to rob this one instead of this cylinder robbing this one so we've moved the events now I'm sure that most people don't take it, this into account now you'll notice it's four and two that fires together now it's not fires together induction number two tends to rob number four before it was number seven tending to rob number five so our intake manifold for a four seven swap needs to be slightly different maybe people are only getting a small change in power from this four seven swap because they are not catering for this i don't know that to be a fact but i suspect it may have something to do with it anyway what do we do to cut down the robbing of one cylinder with the adjacent one well here's what happens let's let's use the cylinders we're going to have to fix here what happens is number four starts this induction stroke and the biggest pulse part of the pulse on the induction stroke happens in the overlap period so this cylinder starts to draw right now when it's 90 degrees down the bore the pressure drop across the valve and in the port uh, is less so when this cylinder draws there's this big negative pressure wave comes up here 
and it expands out and some of the charge that's going down there does this I've exaggerated that so what we've got to do is to try and cut that down because this cylinder never regains that uh, loss this cylinder on the other hand has the benefit of the charge already moving in that uh, roughly in that direction right but the two don't counteract each other we're always at a loss on this cylinder greater than we pick up on this one how do we fix it well the first thing we do the simple mod is to make sure that this cylinder here can draw air from anywhere it wants easily whereas this one we want to try and make it draw air from here the worst possible way it can so what we do is we radius off this turn here so that we leave a knife edge on this side and a nice big radius on this side so the air favors going down here now to make up for this knife edge here what we do is we expand it over here so that the pressure wave can start to fill this area and get diluted or diminished before it ever gets to here so that's what we're going to do in the plenum so I will show you the progress as we go so why would we want to do a 4-7 swap well there is supposedly some advantages in terms of crankshaft torsional vibrations there's not the, the peak vibrations are reportedly less on a uh, with this firing order and there's supposed to be a small power gain I've been told that numerous tests have shown that there is about a 1% gain in power now no, that's not very much but let me point out to you 1% uh, here 1% there 1% somewhere else starts to add up if we get a camshaft from comp cams it costs us virtually nothing to get the 47 swap so we might as well get it and that will pay off so long as we have the right cam timing for it we'll talk about that later here's your first move toward compensating for the robbing of cylinder four by two we grind this here so it's a generous radius all the way down here and this basically is a sharp corner or it will be really sharp by the time I emery it now you could just cut it like this and it will work just fine uh, I need to make this look good because well I've got an audience watching right but um, that's where we go to start with next move is to work on this edge here and this edge here the comparison of these ports and these ports should give you an idea of how much they've been reshaped of course of course we're only going to do it on these ports here let me make a, a few points bring this back here don't round it off because we've got to do the top to match it right so I'm not going to finish that quite yet although we'll we'll do an emery roll job on it this here is a nice big radius and I'm pulling it back here more than along here into this corner same with this here I'm pulling this corner this way not too big a radius on there I don't want it to uh, affect that one and uh, we've got this knife edge here right so now I'm going to emery that so that you can see what it looks like when it's polished up now I'm not going to use it in polished form but it's easier to see the form of it because it reflects the light Well, here 
here's our port shaping up. You can probably see the general trend here. Once again, let me reiterate. We try to make these four edges favor this port. We're having this edge try not to favor this porch. Port, porch. Right, and get this right in a minute. But I've radiused this off here. Now, it's possible to put a bigger radius on, but be aware that a radius tends to damp the shock wave or the pressure wave that comes up the port. Now we want to damp this one and we want to enhance the flow of this one. So it's a whole compromise deal. Uh, but this is what you should aim for. Here's a few points to note here. I'm kind of halfway through dressing the radii into the runners. This one is virtually finished, right? Notice a radius here, not a sharp edge. A sharp edge does not work because the, there is no time when these cylinders are drawing at the same time. So this cylinder needs as big a radius here when it draws as it can get. And this one here also needs it at a different time. So you, the compromise is just a radius. Anyway, a couple of points to note. First off, you see how I've dug this out here. This is so that we can have an end to the runner that's more well defined. I mean, we're limited, we can't do that here, but I've dug this out so that we can put a radius in there and then there's a definite end to the runner. So that's that's that. Now notice that it, the radius on here is around about uh, half an inch, maybe, no, maybe, maybe uh, five sixteenths or so. You do not want too big a radius, and I'll go into that later on. But right now I'm going to finish off these and we're gonna flow test this one on the head and see how much difference dressing this makes to, to having it stock. Oh, hi, you're back. I'm just finishing flow bench teardown here. Float this, it works good. I think I covered most everything before, but see how I exaggerated this corner here so that there was more a well-defined end to the port. Uh, radius, they don't have to go all the way around. On this port, I've done it, but here they're finishing off at a, about a 70 degree angle to this face right this is the knife edge port this port I've just finished flowing flowed less than one CFM less than no manifold this one here flowed less than one CFM difference and this one was about three in spite of that sharp edge and that's mostly because all this round here is large. Now, a couple of points that I didn't raise uh, earlier on which I think I need to uh, uh, deal with and these are first point to note is that all of these uh, techniques can be applied to a single four barrel manifold right at least where it's applicable and that means the uh, um, favoring of the cylinder being robbed in terms of flow generated at the uh, plenum due to putting that sharp edge on to prevent the other one stealing from it. Now the other thing we can do to that port is to make it smaller. This means that the port runs at a higher velocity and that makes it harder for the other one to steal. On the dyno we see this torque curve starts sooner, it makes a few more foot-pounds and a few more horsepower and it carries on longer. There is no downside. All I've got to do now is finish off 
the porting on this with a uh, fine tooth um, burr. We don't need to polish it. And then we'll take a look at the plenum top. We'll talk about that and spacers to go on it. Well here I've put in the uh, anti-streaming uh, uh, countersinks, right? What this does is it stops or vastly reduces raw fuel running off these surfaces here into the ports. If the fuel is running, it gets into one of these countersink holes which have just gone to the point where they've got a, the straight edge of the drill right so that the uh, there's a swirling motion there and the fuel gets reintroduced into the air anyway that's about the last op um, but let me show you the finish on the ports well here we have the lid or the top of our tunnel ram manifold and I'm looking inside here and I don't see anything obvious that needs doing um, I tried it out on the bench and it has almost no effect on uh, airflow it's still within the odd CFM of flowing what the bare port does so the next step is to talk about spacers now I had considered doing this on this video and then I realized there is so much more to spacers than meets the eye that I'm going to do a separate video on it right for now all I need to tell you is that a one inch spacer on here works that's all you need to know at this stage but down the road we're going to test a whole bunch of spacers some designs I guarantee you will never have seen Well, that about wraps up our um, uh, tunnel ram modification uh, uh, video. Uh, but I want to say that this is not the complete, um, uh, how, shall, how shall I say, uh, rundown on how to modify uh, tunnel rams. There are intricacies which apply just to one or two different designs. And we'll have to get into that down the road when we do an engine build. But for now, what I want to say is, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you really liked it, hit the subscribe button. All of our likes and sub subscriptions to our channel will mean that we can do more in-depth and higher tech features on engines. Help us get to that goal. Thank you.